Okay, so today is going to be the last lecture for the material on exam five, and today we'll be going over arteries and veins a little bit more, um, a little bit talk a little bit about blood pressure, and then your exam on Monday will cover, as you know, uh, the chapters 17, 18, and 19, which are the blood, heart, and vessel blood pressure chapters. Uh, vocab on that exam will go through 90, so let me get going on that. Uh, short papers are coming in, thank you, and I'll have those graded uh, by the end of the weekend, I hope. And uh, your take-home exam also was due by midnight tonight, so uh, if you haven't finished it up, make sure that that gets uh, finished up today as well. Any logistical questions for me? Remember that next week's lab is the final lab on the reproductive systems, and we'll also be doing some reviewing. Uh, your pre-lab next week is bonus points. Your quiz next week are bonus points. And if you've been to all 11 labs, done all pre-11, or done all the 11 pre-labs, done all the 11 quizzes, then this will serve as bonus points. If you missed one along the way, then you lost the bonus, but you haven't missed anything, if you will, in the point total. So that's coming your way. Um, the short paper grades, that's worth 50 points. That's coming your way. That should be a very strong score for you. I'm going to go ahead after this exam next Monday, and I'm going to go into your mastering account and determine if you have been doing the vast majority of the assignments. And if you've been doing most of the assignments, then I'll put that 30 points into the grade total as well. So you have everything, you know, you know everything uh, going into the last week or so. If you have not been doing all the mastering assignments and you don't earn all 30 points, you'll then be able to do the last few mastering assignments to raise that score up. If I give you all 30 points for mastering, I won't go back and reevaluate it. Okay, so I still want you to do the assignments for the last exam, but I'm not gonna um, reevaluate your point total. So if you get 30 now, then that 30 will stay in your point total, even if you didn't complete all of the mastering assignments for the last exam. Right, those homework, yeah, the on mastering, those homework assignments, right, that you can do twice. I'll go through, I'll capture the higher of the two grades. I'll look at the total points that you could have earned. I'm looking for 80% average. So an 80, if you have 80% of all the points available, then, or more, you'll get all 30 points. If you have less than 80%, then I'll give you less than the 30 points, some ratio thereof. And again, you would be able to increase that grade um, so if you missed a couple of those assignments way back, or you just didn't do very well on a couple of them, and it pulled you down a little bit, then you can make those points up by doing the last few. Okay, so that, I'll clarify that again once I get that posted. So really then, all once we get past this exam next week, and I get the short paper grade in, and I get your mastering points in, then really all you're going to have left are what? You have a quiz. Remember, you have a quiz, too, uh, preparing you for this material. So that'll all be done by Monday. And then all you'll have left is the final exam at 80 points, the lab practical exam at 100 points, and so about 200 points. You'll have a good 80% of your grade uh, in your grade center uh, by probably next Tuesday or so. Any other logistical questions for me? Anything to clarify? Okay. Well, let's finish up the last little bit of vocab then for this exam. Sterno, we recognize these terms, right? They're getting easier, don't you think? Don't you think vocab's getting easier? Uh, we've seen so many of these words along the way in some other context that I think the vocab starts to become more familiar to us. But sterno, meaning the breast or the chest like the sternum. A stomy, a surgical opening. A tracheostomy is an opening into the trachea. And there's been some new commercials on those, haven't there? Uh, that stop smoking commercial with the guy with the tracheostomy and he's cleaning it out and all that good stuff. So that's a great PSA for people. Um, stria, uh, you know that striations are the striping pattern that we see in muscle. Uh, stasis, standing still. Homeostasis, right? Keeping things relatively the same. Now, homeo though really doesn't mean same. Homeo means similar because it's not called homostasis, right? Homostasis would mean that our blood pressure stays exactly the same, that our blood sugar stays exactly the same. So homeostasis tells us that it stays still, but within a range, within a similar range. Uh, sub, under, that one's pretty familiar. Uh, sulk, you know a sulcus is a groove, right? A furrow, a groove of some sort. 
super and supra, both mean above or upper. So another term, your Amerman book, when it refers to the adrenal glands, calls them, I think it refers to the artery going to the adrenal glands as the suprarenal gland. So supra, right, above, renal, kidney. Adrenal, adrenal, next to the kidney. So adrenal, suprarenal, both mean the same thing. They're both referring to the same gland. Uh, sim and sin. Uh, we go to the symphony, right, to listen to the phonies come together, the sound, so coming together. Uh, synthesis, things being brought together. Systole, we know now, is contraction. So when the heart is in systole, it's in a contractile phase. Tachy, fast. Tachycardia is a rapid heart rate. Over 100 beats a minute, we would say you have tachycardia. Tars, the tarsals were your ankle bones, but it actually refers to the foot. And telo, remember telophase? The last phase, the end, or telodendria at the end. So telo, and then someone said the other day to me, they said, and telephone. Right? I hear it at the end. I never thought about telephone, right? But telephone also fits here. I hear the sound at the end. Tempo, time. If you're keeping the tempo, you're keeping the time. Uh, tens, if something is creating tension, then it's being stretched. Tetan, tetanus, uh, lockjaw, if you will, uh, a stiffening. Tetra, a kind of a fun game with four parts. And therm, right, like a thermometer measuring heat. Thoras, we know refers to the chest. Thrombo, another name for platelets are what? Thrombocytes. And we know thrombo, thrombo means blood clot, the cells that produce blood clots, right? Thrombocytes or thrombo. Uh, tomy or tome to some sort of cut or incision. So an appendectomy or an appendectomy would be a cutting or the incision of the appendix. When we were dealing with blood cells back in lab two, we talked about hypo and hyper and isotonic. The tonicity part of that, the tonic part, was referring to the pressure or the tension that is uh, exhibited by the water. And then finally for this test, uh, again, tono meaning force. Topo, if you have an ectopic pregnancy, you have a pregnancy that's out of place, ecto meaning outside, on the outer area, so ecto. Ecto, or sorry, ectopic pregnancy, an out-of-place pregnancy. A toxin is a poison, and if you are in traction, then you have your leg up in the hospital and they're pulling or dragging your bones back into their proper place. So track to drag or draw. Also think about the fallopian duct, or sorry, the, uh, you'll hear about called the um, uh, fallopian tract as well. So the egg is being drawn or dragged down the tube. So that'll bring us to our vocabulary for the exam on Monday. Again, that exam, full-length exam, you'll need your Scantron form, and you would also just need a pencil with a good eraser, and you'll have the entire two hours. All we'll have left then is about 11 or 12 slides that will be part of exam number six, your final exam. The final exam is not cumulative. It is a non-cumulative final, just another unit exam equal the same as all the others. Any thoughts or concerns over anything we've done so far over blood, like typing, or anything with the heart structures, flow of blood through the heart? And last time, I barely got started talking about arteries and veins. Anything so far? You've all been quizzed on this already. In lab, you had the double quiz this week, so you had a quiz over blood typing and the heart and the flow of blood through the heart. You also had a quiz on vessels. So. Hopefully this is all coming together for you nicely. If you did well on those quizzes, yay, you're on your way to really mastering it. If you struggled a little bit, you know what was emphasized, and you know what to focus on as you move forward this weekend. The exam quiz, that quiz that's on mastering, should also help you uh, solidify some ideas as you study that quiz. That quiz has a deadline of what? Is it Sunday? Mm -hmm. I forget right now, honestly, did I make it midnight? Mm -hmm. yes, or did I make it noon? Noon on Sunday, okay. I can't remember which one I did. And again, I'm giving you, by doing that, I'm kind of forcing you to get that done earlier, uh, which will hopefully facilitate better learning. If we wait to the last second, people, by human nature, wait to the last second, and then they don't have the time to let it all sink in when they're done. So I wanna give you as much time as possible to get that quiz done, and then think about the things that you did well on and to continue to master what you struggled with. 
So looking forward then, I discussed a little bit about the blood vessels, just the idea that these vessels are traveling through your body, and we've been learning about them uh, by name. You know quite a few arteries and veins, uh, and, and I'll pick up right here. We know that arteries are always carrying blood away from the heart, and that those arteries, as they move away, are going to get smaller and smaller. They're going to branch or bifurcate, and as they are branching, um, they're eventually going to feed that blood down into capillaries. The capillaries are where all the gas exchange happens, where the nutrients are exchanged, the water exchange occurs, and then that blood will return through a series of veins and eventually come back to the heart. Arteries, as I've already mentioned, are going to get smaller and smaller as they move away from the heart, whereas veins are going to get larger and larger as they come back toward the heart. Okay, this is where I was picking up from last time, right? That there are layers in your blood vessels, three layers. Uh, this is the same if it's an artery or a vein. You have three layers, and those layers are called tunics. Tunica intima, or the tunica interna. This is the more inner layer, and it's composed of a very thin layer of epithelial cells. You, you would call them simple squamous right, by shape and layers, simple squamous, and the nickname for these, for this layer is the endothelium, right, endo meaning within, so within the blood vessel, there's this thin layer of tissue. Then the tunica media is the middle layer, this is all muscle, smooth muscle, and it's here, there's a lot of control, so when your body is sending more blood or less blood to one part of the body or another, it is controlled largely through squeezing or relaxing the smooth muscle in this layer, the middle layer called the tunica media. Then the outer layer is referred to as the tunica externa, referred to also as the adventitia, but I'll always refer to it as the externa in my exam. And this is the outer layer that's going to basically help adhere the vessel to wherever it's traveling through the wall. So these arteries and veins are not just straws or tubes or hoses just randomly running through your body. They are uh, strategically placed, obviously, but they're also adhered to predictable places by this tunica externa. There's some collagen, there's some elastin here, and finally there is a uh, substructure called the vasa visorum, and vas will be our last list, but vas means vessel. So the vessel of the vessels, the vasa visorum, and we'll see in the picture in a moment that your arteries and veins have a network of even smaller arteries uh, that are bringing blood to the cells. Now I'm going to give you a little mention that what one of the things that will be on this test uh, will be a triple Venn diagram. So something like this. And um, one of the circles will represent arteries, one will represent veins, and one will rep represent capillaries. And um, then I'll give you a series of facts. And um, so if I said something like involved with the cardiovascular system, you would, um, so that's arteries, veins, and capillaries. And then this would be A, this would be B, this would be C. Uh, maybe I'd have you fill in A and C for this, B and C for this, A and B for this and I don't know, probably A, B, C, or just all of them. Okay, can you read that? So if I give you a little fact over here that said involved with the cardiovascular system, it, obviously they're all involved with the cardiovascular system, so for that question you would type in or bubble in A, B, and C. If I said to you are, um, and, we'll, and we're going to get into some of these facts right now, if I said to you um, always carry blood away from the heart, you know that those are going to be what? artery, so you would bubble in A for that answer, okay? So as I'm going through this presentation over the next hour or so, uh, talking about arteries and veins and capillaries, you're, you're thinking about, okay, what are the facts that he's sharing with me? What are the comparing and contrasting facts that he could ask me in a Venn diagram like this? So that'll definitely be a part of your exam on Monday. So let's go back and look at some facts here. So in arteries, and these are exactly the kind of facts I'm talking about. In arteries, when you compare an artery next to a vein, you would see that the tunica media will be the thickest layer in arteries. 
Now, I'm going to get a little ahead of myself here, but why would arteries need a thicker layer of muscle? Why would arteries, compared to veins, need to have a thicker layer of muscle? Yeah. Arteries are under a much greater pressure, right? Arteries are taking blood away from the heart. The heart is contracting under tremendous pressure and pushing that blood to all points. And so arteries need to be able to resist that pressure. What happens when arteries no longer can resist the pressure and they bulge? We call that an aneurysm, right? And that can be deadly if that aneurysm blows. So arteries have to have a substantial layer of muscle to protect them from this great pressure. Now, when you compare arteries to veins, you'll see that veins have their thickest layer is the tunica externa. Because veins don't have a thick muscle layer. Thick veins are under very little pressure, as we'll continue to discuss. Now, if I had an artery next to a vein, on the outside, the overall structure would look about the same. So if you can just for imagine, imagine for a moment, you're looking at the Soam cell model upstairs, and in the thigh, you would see the femoral artery traveling right next to the femoral vein. From the outside, those two structures are going to look largely the same size. One would be red, one would be blue, but from the outside, they look to be the same size. If you cut into them, though, what you would see is that the lumen of the artery is going to be more narrow. Okay, so the inside lumen is more narrow. And so more narrow in the artery, obviously bigger, right, larger lumen in the vein. Arteries are also going to contain more elastin than veins. And, and this makes sense, too, as you think about it. Arteries are under greater pressure. But how do you measure someone's pulse? Well, you put their finger on their radial artery or in the neck at the carotid artery. And what you're actually feeling is the pulsing, the stretching, the recoiling of the blood as it goes through the artery. So clearly, arteries must be more elastic. So arteries stretch and recoil. When blood is leaving your aorta, your aorta is you know, kind of stretching and recoiling each and every time. Veins um, tend to collapse. Veins are very weak. Uh, next week, when we dissect the hearts, and you are comparing the aorta coming out of the heart and comparing the superior vena cava, you're going to see very, very clearly how muscular the aorta is and how very wimpy the vena cava are. They really don't have much structure to them at all. And so veins tend to collapse, whereas an artery, if you pushed on an artery, it would kind of bounce back at you. It's very muscular, very strong. A vein, very wimpy, very little muscle. They tend to be uh, flattened. They tend to collapse. <clears throat> and this is really why you get varicose veins. Uh, varicose veins are veins that are full of os, full of blood, and because they don't push back, the, the veins get stretched and distended, and then, remember, veins are also more toward the surface of the body, and so you see these lovely spider veins and other uh, evidence of collapsed veins. Now, when it comes to capillaries, capillaries do not have three tunics. Capillaries only have one layer. They only are composed of the tunica intima. That is, they're only composed of that very, very thin endothelial layer with just enough basement membrane to hold them all together. Now, remember, capillaries are where the gases are exchanging. So what kind of epithelium do we have here? Simple squamous, right, in the capillaries. Where else have you seen simple squamous epithelium? and the alveoli of the lung, and what else is going on there? Gas exchange, right? So again, we're seeing this idea that structure and function always go together. And so where we have simple squamous epithelium, capillaries, and the alveoli of the lung are the two primo places where gas exchange, and uh, in the case of your tissue capillaries, where nutrients are also being exchanged. This is a fantastic table. So when it comes time to uh, study for this Venn diagram idea, the facts I'm going to ask you are going to come from this table. So this might be, I know it's small, but this might be one of those pages that you pull up on your laptop or computer and take a look at and look at it in larger size and imagine you were 
uh, you had these little facts and you were filling it into that triple Venn diagram kind of idea. So just to highlight uh, on this table, the lumen diameter, right? The lumen diameter is more narrow in an artery, more narrow in the artery, but wider in a vein. The overall thickness of the wall, right, is thicker in an artery than a vein. If I were to cut into an artery, I would see that the lumen is smaller, but also that it retains its three-dimensional shape. Of, again, an artery is thicker, more muscular, so it'll retain its circular shape, whereas veins tend to collapse. The thickest layer in the artery is the tunica media, whereas it's the tunica externa in the vein. There is going to be more elastin in an artery because of its elasticity, its need to recoil. Arteries are under greater pressure, right? There's a lot more blood pressure traveling through the arteries. There's very little pressure uh, going through your veins. Blood flow directionally is always moving away from the heart in an artery, always coming back to the heart in veins. And when it comes to oxygen levels, can I say that arteries are always red? No, arteries are not always red. We know of two exceptions. What are the two exceptions? The first one's on our models. Pulmonary arteries are blue. And in your lifetime, also the umbilical, right? So the umbilical and the pulmonary arteries and veins are the ones that are flipped. So a classic question on any anatomy and physiology exam, forever and ever, true, false, would be, are arteries always red? right, or something like that. And no, they're not always red. There are some blue arteries and there are some red veins. But that's why this, this bottom thing down here, your systemic arteries, right, all the typical arteries of your body, they are red. They are high in oxygen. The exception are the pulmonary arteries, which are blue. And then vice versa, most of your veins are low, they're blue, but the pulmonary veins are red because they're carrying lots of oxygen back to the heart from the lungs. So study that table. It'll go a long way to helping you with that section. Now that's a table. Here's pretty much everything put into a, a, into a picture. So if you're more of a, of a visual learner, maybe you'll want to focus more on this slide. So we're looking at an artery on the left and a vein on the right. The tunica intima is the same in both. It's just this thin, inner layer, okay, that endothelium or the simple squamous. The tunica media, much, much thicker in the artery, right, really, really thick tunica media, pretty wimpy one over here on the vein, not a lot of muscle. The tunica externa, thickest over here on the vein. Not for really any purpose. Honestly, it's not thicker because it's doing something special. It's almost like, in my thinking, the tunica externa is thicker only because the muscle is so wimpy. Okay. Um, and then here's that term I used, vasa visorum, the vessel of the vessels. And if you look, uh, you'll see in the outer layer, in the tuna, tunica externa, you'll see all those little red and blue dots. And those are little vessels bringing oxygen and carrying oxygen away from the vessel itself. So what that tells you is that the blood that's going through the artery and vein is not delivering oxygen to the artery or the vein. The vein is, or the artery is just a conduit. It's just a carrier for the blood. There's another blood supply that brings oxygen and nutrients to the cells. I, I think I finished up last time saying, don't forget that arteries and veins are living. They're not just hoses or pipe, you know, pipes going through your body, that they are themselves composed of cells. That the inside, the tunica intima, is made up of endothelial or epithelial cells. And the tunica media is made up of muscle. And the tunica externa has fibroblasts that are making the collagen and elastin fibers. So we've got to feed these cells just like any other cell in the body. And that's what this vasa Visorum does, the outer layer, has its own little set of arteries and veins. In the very center of this diagram, we have a capillary bed. 
And capillary beds or capillaries tend to travel in clusters called a capillary bed. So this is the capillary bed. And this diagram is also showing us that there's only one layer. There's only the tunica intima. There is no muscle layer. There is no external layer around a capillary. It makes sense because what are capillaries doing? This is where we're exchanging gases and nutrients, and we wouldn't want a thick layer of muscle or a thick layer of, of collagen in some way disrupting that exchange. So you've only got a thin layer, very delicate. Capillaries are very, very delicate. And we'll talk about the blood pressure differences here in a few moments. Other things on this slide, uh, the lumen. All right, the lumen of an artery is more narrow. There's a much wider lumen in a vein. And finally, not mentioned yet, many of your larger veins have within them valves. And these valves are going to make sure that blood is only moving in one direction, but they're also going to, as we'll see in a moment, assure that blood doesn't continue to pool around your ankles. Gravity would win um, the battle of pulling fluid down to your feet if it weren't for these valves. And as blood is returned, it can't go back down because of the valves. So we'll discuss that more in a moment as well. So let's go through, now we have the big picture of things. Let me give you a few more factoids about arteries. I already mentioned some of this. You know that they're typically not always, typically carrying oxygenated blood, that is red blood, with the pulmonary arteries being the exception. And there, it turns out there are basically three different types of arteries. The largest arteries are also called the elastic arteries. Okay, why? They're the ones that need the most recoil, right? They're the ones that are under the greatest pressure. So as you're thinking about breaking this down, I want you to just think of the aorta, the pulmonary trunk, the pulmonary arteries. Think of those as being the elastic arteries. Big, lots of elastin because they must, they must withstand that big pressure as the blood is leaving the heart. These are as big as two and a half centimeters in diameter. So we're talking about a big old one inch garden hose coming off your heart. The second or the middle sized arteries are also called the muscular arteries. And these are basically the arteries that are the ones you've named, the other ones that you've named in lab. So think here the brachial, the femoral, um, the common iliac. Think of all the other arteries that you've named on the Flat Stanley model or on the Solmso model. We would say that those are muscular arteries. Muscular, they still have a very thick tunica media. They still have a lot of muscle to, to um, withstand the pressure, but not as much elastin as what was in the aorta. Right? So it's kind of a relative thing. More elastin at the beginning, less elastin as we move through the arteries. Then finally, those muscular arteries, and please don't worry about the size. Don't, don't memorize these, these sizes just to give you a, a, a sense of size. Then the smallest arterioles, um, and we're talking microscopic at this point, uh, these are the smallest of the arteries. Ol, we know, means little, right, arterioles. And um, it's interesting that even down here at the smallest little arterioles, there's still an awful lot of muscle. I mean, there's still a lot of smooth muscle here because it's here in the arterioles that the body controls blood flow. So if you're going to have more blood flow going to your muscles and less blood flow going to your gut, that control happens at these minuscule arterioles. That smooth muscle is going to squeeze down or relax and allow more blood flow. So once we get down to the arterioles, and I'm not going to have you um, worry about histology here, but if I were to show this middle image to you, you should be able to at least tell me this. This is the lumen, and the inside layer, that would be the what? The tunica intima, which is composed of what? Just a single layer of simple squamous, a.k.a. the endothelium. The thicker pink layer, right, that's the thickest layer, that is the what? The tunica 
media, smooth muscle. And then the outer layer was blue up here. This stuff would be the tunica externa, largely made of collagen and elastin. Okay. So those are all different size arteries. Don't, don't worry about anything there. As long as you can recognize the three layers, you're fine. Now, once we get past the arteries, we come out of the arterioles. Now we're going to bring the blood into capillaries. So the capillaries, you can think of them as being the connector between the arterial side and the venous side. They're going to be the connector between the arterioles and the small venules. They're only 8 to 10 microns thick. Now, I do want you to think about this for a second. How big is a red blood cell? When we were learning about red blood cells, the number kept reappearing. And that is that red blood cells are only seven and a half microns across. And I'm telling you that capillaries are only eight to 10 microns thick. So you get the idea that it's a pretty claustrophobic little squeeze, right? As red blood cells go down into capillaries, uh, it's pretty claustrophobic. And we already know that red blood cells are very flexible. Right, because we saw when we were dealing with isotonic and hypotonic, we saw that red blood cells could swell up or they could crenate. So we already have a sense that they're kind of flexible, and they do. They kind of uh, squiggle their way through these capillaries. Now, again, capillaries are only made up of the tunica intima, the inner layer. And, of course, as we've said over and over, this is where all the nutrient and gas exchange is happening. Because this is where all the business is happening, as far as the nutrient and gas exchange, the cardiovascular system functional units are the capillaries. And let me quiz you on this. Uh, what, what other functional units have we learned about this semester? If I said functional unit and I said bone, the functional unit of bone? And you would say, hopefully, the osteon. Remember that big cylindrical structure with the canaliculi? So that would be, quote, the functional unit. We're going to learn in lab this week uh, that the functional unit of the kidney are those microscopic sets of tubes called, an, called a nephron. Um, in the muscle, what was the functional unit? What was that unit that slid over the myofibrils, the myofilaments, the actins and myosins? That little Z to Z area was called a sarcomere. All right, so this is all these microscopic business ends of the tissues. So the capillaries are the functional unit of the cardiovascular system. And they don't work by themselves. They're going to work in little clusters in what's called a capillary bed. Now tell me, what kind of doctor looks at capillaries every day? What kind of doctor would regularly look at capillaries? And the reason, I'm jumping ahead of myself a little bit, but capillaries are very delicate. And if you have hypertension, if you have high blood pressure, um, your capillaries can get blown out. They, they really are very sensitive to high blood pressure. So what kind of doctor would regularly look at your capillaries and could perhaps be the first person to say, you know what? I'm worried you may have some hypertension. You, you may not know about it, but... I'm worried you may have some hypertension. A uh, nephrologist would talk about capillaries, but they wouldn't be looking at them every day. What kind of doctor actually sees your capillaries? I heard cardiologist, no. Eye doctor, your optometrist. When you go in for your eye exam, they usually dilate your eyes. They're going to take that ophthalmoscope, and they're going to look back into your retina, and on the retina, they're actually looking at your capillaries. They're looking at the overall health of that choroid layer and of the retinal layer. And if you have diabetes, they're taking pictures of those capillaries and recording that. Because with hypertension, right, hypertension, high blood pressure, those capillaries can begin to get blown out. And that can lead to vision problems. Diabetics also have an issue because high sugar also damages the capillaries. And the eye doctor will see that. Okay, so again, optometrist or an ophthalmologist uh, would be looking at your eyes routinely and literally look at the capillaries back on the retina. 
Now, here's a new fact, uh, something that a new term we haven't seen at all, and that is a meta arterial. Uh, I'll show you a picture of this in a moment, but as the blood is going into the capillary bed, I mean, we're down to microscopic structures, right? Very, very small. But as the blood is going into the capillary bed, there are going to be a, a little vessel, a little connection area called the meta arterial. And around that meta arterial, there's going to be some smooth muscle sphincters. We know that sphincters are, are circular muscle groups. And these little muscular, muscular sphincters are going to open and close. And what they're really going to do is control how much blood can come into the capillary as a protective device. If too much blood is coming in at, under high pressure, you're going to blow out that capillary. So we want to make sure we're always regulating the amount of blood that can come in. And uh, your capillaries are constantly sort of squeezing and relaxing, contracting and relaxing about five to 10 times every minute. And this overall squeezing and relaxing is called vasomotion. Remember, vas means vessel. So here's a simplified cartoon of a capillary bed. And as one can see, the blood is coming in on the arterial side. They've stripped away on this cartoon, they've stripped away the tunica externa. Remember, there would be a tunica externa on an arterial. And what we're seeing now are just the smooth muscle cells. Remember, the smooth muscle cells have that fusiform shape to them. So that's what we're seeing, all those little fusiform shaped smooth muscle cells lining the arterial. The blood is going to come into a capillary bed. This connector right here, that's the meta arterial. So the little connection piece, right, the little, the little connection between the arterial and the actual capillary bed, that is the meta arterial. And what you see is that at the beginning of all this, on what we would call the proximal end of the capillary bed, you'll see those little muscle sphincter cells wrapped around. So these are the little muscle cells that are going to squeeze and relax and are going to control how much blood is able to come into the capillary bed. And what you also see is in that is that uh, we see coloring going from red to blue, telling us that gas exchange is happening here. We're dropping off oxygen. We're picking up CO2. And on the other end of the capillary bed, the blood is leaving. It's going to travel out a very small vein, and a very small vein is called a venule. Okay? And again, on this venule, they've stripped away uh, the outer layers. Now, right down the very center, clean this off, right down the very center of this thing, you can see that there's what's called the thoroughfare channel. And that is the way by which blood can go directly from the arterial side and get right over to the venous side and not even go out into the capillaries. All of your capillaries are not open at any one moment. All of your capillaries are not doing gas exchange at one moment. We'll discuss this in greater detail the next semester, but if all of your capillaries opened up at once, and all of your blood could go into all of your capillaries, your blood pressure would drop boom, really, really fast. And we call that shock. So shock is when all of your blood vessels open up and your blood pressure just goes plummeting down. So we don't want that to happen. We, we want to keep a certain number of our capillaries closed off so that we don't increase that, that surface area too much. And, uh, that keeps our overall blood pressure well regulated. So this is also brand new, if you will, if you've been looking, at, thinking a little bit about capillaries. There's three types of capillaries, three types. Um, continuous capillaries. These are your boring, typical type of capillary. These are the ones you're dreaming about when you dream about capillaries, right? These are the ones going to all of your tissues. These are the capillaries that are exchanging gases and nutrients. And they're called continuous because there's no openings in them. Uh, they do have that simple squamous layer, but there, there's no breaks in the capillary. This is what you're going to find going to all of your tissues in your body. 
but there are also fenestrated capillaries. And in lab this week, you saw fenestrated capillaries. And where were they? Where did we discuss capillaries with holes in them? In the kidney, right? In the kidney, those in the glomerulus, in those leaky capillaries of the kidney. And I introduced the word to you at that point, fenestrated. And I need to add this to our vocab list, but fenestra means window from the Latin. So fenestrated capillaries are capillaries with holes, windows, gaps, spaces in them. Now, we find these fenestrated capillaries in the kidney. That makes sense, does it not? Because we're filtering. We need small openings for small waste products to get through those leaky capillaries. But we also find fenestrated capillaries in your small intestine and in your endocrine glands. Why? Why would you have fenestrated capillaries in your small intestine? What are we doing there? We're absorbing nutrients. And some of those nutrients, the way I think about it, are a little chunky. So some of those molecules that we're absorbing into our gut, into our bloodstream, are a little bit larger, and they need to be able to go through little openings, little gaps. Okay? And then why would you also have fenestrated capillaries around some of your endocrine organs? What are, what are they doing? They're releasing hormones. Hormones are big. And so we'd have to get those hormones out of the gland and into the bloodstream, so there'd have to be some openings. It makes sense, doesn't it, why you would have fenestrated capillaries. Now, the third type of capillaries are sinusoidal or discontinuous capillaries. Now, these are capillaries with huge gaping holes in them. Right? What's a sinus? Sinus, a big space, right? So sinusoid or sinusoidal uh, capillaries are ones with big spaces, big gaping holes in them. And these are going to be found in your bone marrow, endocrine glands also, liver and spleen. Let's come up with a reason why we are not surprised by that. Why would you find large gaping holes in the capillaries of your bone marrow? Bone marrow is making not only red blood cells, but also your white blood cells and the platelets. All of those formed elements are being produced there. They've got to get into the blood, don't they? So we need to have some really large gape, gaping holes in the capillaries. Endocrine glands, we've already discussed. Hormones are being released, so we've got to have big openings for those hormones. What about the liver and spleen? What's going on there that we've discussed in the past that would require they have large openings? They are producing bile, but that's, that's, that's more of an internal thing. But what's, what else is the liver and spleen doing? Are, are they doing? Remember that's where red blood cells are being broken down? So this is where red blood cells go to die. This is, the, this is where, you know, when the dollar bills get worn out, they get taken out of circulation. Same idea. The liver and spleen are taking your red blood cells out. They survive for about 120 days, and then they get wiped out. So they have to be taken out of the bloodstream, don't they? So that makes sense that we'd have to have large openings. Now, take a look at this picture. This may make it even easier for you to imagine. So here are your continuous capillaries, boring, normal capillaries. There's a red blood cell. And notice it's not that much smaller than the actual capillary itself, right? Pretty tight squeeze going through that. All we have is a layer of simple squamous cells, right? One layer of cells. Fenestrated capillaries, kidney, where else? Small intestine, um, endocrine glands, right? Again, little openings. You see those little breaks? Those are like filtering, little tiny openings like we see in the filtering glomeruli of the kidney. Red blood cells would never fit through that opening, would they? Right? You get a sense that there's no way a red blood cell, large things would never fit through those fenestrations. Now, take a look at the sinusoidal or the discontinuous. These holes now are big enough for entire blood cells to enter and leave. So we've got these big holes, again, liver, spleen for the recycling of red blood cells, the filtering of your blood, and the um, endocrine organs as well. And what was the last place? Endocrine, liver, spleen, and bone marrow, right? Because that's where you're producing the formed elements. They have to get into the bloodstream. 
Does that story make sense? So far, we talked about arteries a little bit more. We talked about capillaries a little bit more. Let's continue the conversation with veins. So we know that veins are draining the capillaries, or, or the capillaries are draining, I guess I should say, into the veins. And those veins are going to bring that blood back to your heart. We've already said that they're relatively thin-walled, not a lot of muscle at all, and that their lumen is rather large, comparatively. They typically are carrying deoxygenated or venous blood, blue blood, back to the right atrium of the heart, but we know the exception being the pulmonary veins. The blood pressure here is much lower. So whereas arteries are under tremendous pressure, veins are under much reduced blood pressure. And if I were to ask you right now, um, of all your five or so liters of blood in your body, is most of it in your arteries, most of it in your veins? I, I would probably guess it's probably 50-50, right? That your arteries and veins are kind of split at rest right now, that half your blood's in your arteries, half your blood's in your veins. But in reality, about 60% of your blood is sitting in your veins. And I guess it really does make more sense when you think about it because the, the lumen is larger of your veins. There's more space to, to store that blood. And then if you were about to exercise and your body needed to be able to pull more blood over into the heart, it makes sense, too, that there's extra blood in the venous, on the venous side than in the arterial side. So as you sit there right now, about 60% of your blood is sitting in your veins, only about 40% in your arteries. So the smallest veins are called the venules. Again, quite small. Don't worry about the numbers, but we're going to get bigger and bigger as we come back. And the blood pressure is very low. We, gravity would win this battle. And the, the, in fact, the, 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 the pressure is so low in your veins that blood would pool back toward your ankles just from the force of gravity. So to prevent that pooling, to prevent that blood from pooling, there are valves, a number of valves, uh, found in predictable places in your veins, especially the veins of your, of your legs. And I'll show you a cartoon in a moment to appreciate what those valves are doing. It is possible for those valves to become defective. And if those valves start to break down, then blood will start pooling more toward the lower extremities. And if those valves start to fail, this is also a, a contributing factor to varicose veins. Because if those valves are not doing their job, then the blood's going to pool backwards, and it's going to start to spread out those wimpy veins into larger distended structures. But typically, those uh, valves are going to keep blood uh, moving along, not allow it to come back, if you will. There's also, um, as you walk, um, most of your larger veins, bringing the majority of the blood back to your heart, are located deep and next to your muscle groups. So as you walk, for example, your gastrocnemius, right, lateral and medial head of your gastrocnemius is squeezing every time you walk. And as you walk, it's squeezing on that vein, so it's actually helping to push the blood up. So each time you walk, you're pushing blood up. Those valves are also you know, helping not to let it drop back down. Once it gets up to a certain point in the elevator right, or the silo, it can't come back down. And um, <clears throat> so, so the best thing you can do then is walk. Right? One of the best things you do for your heart is to walk. And we call these muscles that are working as a pump quite easily the, the skeletal muscle pump. So here's a, a picture of this. So just a diagram. So you've got blood coming back from your lower extremities. It's coming up through veins. There are valves. And as you squeeze the muscles, it's going to squeeze that blood up and through the next valve. And then that valve would close, right? So the blood would not be able to pull back down. So we've got the valves helping. We've got the skeletal muscle pump helping. What else is helping to pull blood back to the heart? There's one more important thing that's helping to pull blood back to the heart. Anything, any, any idea? Anybody own a pool or a hot tub or hang around one anytime? 
what does that pump do? <laughs> that pump is not only pushing water out, the heart is not only pushing blood out, but that pump is also doing what? <sighs> sucking, right? It's a closed system. So the heart itself is also sucking blood back to itself. Okay, so what happens to any muscle in your body that works harder, that gets used more? It what? Well, it may wear out faster, but it also gets larger. If I go to the gym and I work out my muscles, my muscles will get larger, right? So what if your heart is having to work extra hard to pull blood back? And maybe it's having to work extra hard to pull blood back because you're not very active. So you're not really helping the heart out by walking. You're not using your skeletal muscle pumps. Maybe your valves have become leaky or defective. And so really, you're depending upon the heart to work even harder to suck that blood back. That, that heart's going to slowly get bigger, isn't it? And the problem is, you don't want to have an enlarged heart. You want your heart to be a small, efficient little working machine. And it's most efficient when it's small. And as we age, the heart does become larger because it's having to work harder. And that increased size makes the heart less efficient. Okay. We don't want to hear that you have an enlarged heart. That's not usually a good sign. What keeps the heart from keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger? What's around the heart? That pericardium, specifically that sac, that fibrous pericardium. That, if you go back and look at the notes, I mentioned to you that the, the um, fibrous pericardium is preventing the, the heart from overfilling with blood. It helps to hold it in its place, but it's also going to prevent the heart from enlarging too much. So at some point, as we age, our heart will get bigger and bigger a little bit, and that's normal. But there is a limit to how big it can get because of the pericardium. And we don't want a large heart anyway because a large heart, like I said, is not very efficient. So this is a final review slide of arteries versus veins. Again, if you're a visual learner, uh, this is a great one to look at. Again, think about characterizing or categorizing uh, arteries, veins, and capillaries with different facts. So... Quickly again, uh, arteries, the largest ones are the elastic arteries. They have more elastic structures in their tunica externa. The regular, typical, medium-sized artery is your muscular artery, still with a very thick layer of tunica media. Your smallest arteries are the arterioles, and they still have, if you look at it, they still have a very substantial layer of tunica media. Get down to the capillaries, again, only one layer thick, just the tunica externa. Then we come back through the small veins, the venules. The medium size and the large side veins are the ones with the valves in them. Okay, so you'll only see the valves in the larger and medium sized, and then typically only in the lower extremities. So this is, this is really, the valves are only really there in your leg veins, uh, not so much any place else. Questions on arteries versus veins versus capillaries? Anything at all? Well, let's talk about something really practical for a moment, and that is blood pressure. So anybody here measure blood pressure regularly as part of their job? Anybody? Okay, so we got a couple people who are doing that. You do the old-fashioned way or stick their hand in a, stick their arm in a machine? Old-fashioned way, okay. So we've all had blood pressure taken, though. So what, what are we doing? What, why are we taking blood pressure, and what is it telling us? I'll let you tell me. Why do we take blood pressure? What are we measuring? Measuring the pressure, right, on your vessels, really what you're doing. And we're going to measure this pressure. Uh, it's really going to be measured in units of millimeters of mercury, so it's measured in units of millimeters of mercury. There it is. And it's going to be measured by a sphincter Now, you know sphincter means pulse. So with on the blood pressure cuff, that little dial instrument, that's called the sphincter And um, you're basically measuring the amount of force that's being put or the pressure that's being put on the inside wall of your vessels. 
So as the heart contracts, as the heart undergoes systole, especially ventricular systole, when the ventricles are squeezing, that blood is being forced out through the aortic valve and the pulmonary valve under pretty high pressure. Remember, the left ventricle is so much more muscular. We discussed last time how the two sides of the heart must be pumping the same volume, but they do pump under different pressures. So the right side is much wimpier. It's not pushing blood to the, to the lungs under the same high pressure as blood is being pumped to the left side uh, and to the rest of your body. So the average uh, pressure is going to be somewhere, you'll see different numbers, but about 120 over 80, 120 over 75, something like that. Those two numbers, the upper number is your systolic pressure. That is, that's the pressure on the inside of your vessels when the heart is squeezing. The lower number, your diastolic pressure, is the amount of pressure on the inside of your vessels when the heart is relaxed in diastole. Anything over 140 systolic or over 90 diastolic is considered hypertensive. So as long as those two numbers are below 140 over 90, life is good, it's normal. If it gets over 140 over 90 or either number goes higher, then you are considered hypertensive. You've got some issues with your blood pressure. Which of those two numbers would you be more concerned about? You go to the doctor and, and you have a pressure, uh, let's say 140 over 85, or are you more worried about a 130 over 95? Which, which number are you more concerned about for your overall cardiovascular health if it's higher? I heard the right answer, but I want more people thinking about it. Which number are you more concerned about, the systolic or the diastolic, the upper or the lower? Diastolic. I'm hearing diastolic mostly. And that's right, because what is that telling you? If you have a 130 over 95, well, the 130 is okay. The 95 is high. And you're going to be more concerned about that because what is that telling you? That your vessels are under abnormally high pressure even when the heart is relaxed, suggesting right that overall your, your vessels are not as healthy as they should be. So a little bit of a higher systolic pressure, okay, but you're more concerned about a, an ongoing higher diastolic pressure every time you go back. Most, well, I won't say most, but a large part of our population is on some sort of blood pressure medication by the time they get to age 50, in large part because we know that over time, hypertension is called the silent killer for a reason. Over time, high blood pressure destroys the kidney, destroys the retina of the eye, destroys many of your vessels. And so if we can keep blood pressure under control, then we'll have a longer, healthier life with fewer strokes and heart attacks. So we, we know that the pharmaceutical companies love that, but that's just the way it is, where a lot of us are on some sort of statin, some sort of blood pressure medication. Um, so when the blood is leaving the heart, right, it's about 120 over 80 or so. And then where do we normally take one's blood pressure? Right? Brachial artery. So we take that sphincter we take that blood pressure cuff, and we squeeze it around the arm. And, and what do we do then? What's, what's next? You've all had your blood pressure taken. What's the next thing you experience? Squeeze, 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 right? And um, I'll go through that with you in a moment. And then that pressure is released, and the nurse or the physician or somebody is now figuring out what your blood pressure is. So we'll talk about that. By the time the blood goes down to your capillaries, the pressure has reduced significantly. It's no longer 120 over 80. The further away you go from the heart, the lower the pressure. So if you're going to take the blood pressure of someone's uh, uh, femoral artery or take someone's pressure down at their feet, that pressure would be less because it's traveled further away from the heart. By the time the blood goes through the capillaries and comes back through the veins, the pressure drops almost to zero. So what does that tell us? Blood's not being pushed through the veins. Blood is being sucked, right? It's being pushed up by the skeletal muscle pump. It's being restricted by the valves. It's being sucked up by the heart. But there's nothing pushing blood through your veins. It's sort of being pulled. 
This is why, too, veins can collapse, right? There, there's nothing really pulling them back. Can you have veins removed from your body? Can you have varicose veins stripped out of your leg? Yeah. Absolutely. Why? Why is that okay? Why can you have varicose veins removed for, co well, they don't remove them for cosmetic reasons, right? They'll only remove them if they hurt. So the word is this, if you have varicose veins and you want them removed and you want your insurance to cover them, complain that they hurt. I didn't say that, right? I didn't say that. Um, but, but they will remove them if they're, if they're itchy or painful for you. But we can remove those veins, can't we? Why? Why is that okay? You've got others. Are veins delivering nutrients? Are they delivering oxygen? Are they delivering hormones? All they are is a conduit back to the heart. And if you strip out some veins, but you still have the majority of the other veins bringing the blood back to the heart, okay, fine. Right? So you can take veins out, life is good, and blood will still return back to the heart through the other veins. Can we remove arteries? No, because arteries don't have as many branching options. And if you, if you remove an artery, you're likely going to starve an area of the body from the oxygen and the nutrients that it carries. So... Let's take a look at this diagram. Across the bottom, um, we're looking at the aorta, moving through the bigger arteries, down to the arterioles, the capillaries, the venules, the veins, and then the vena cava. As the blood is leaving the heart, about 120 over 80. We'll just say that's the average. And so at the aorta, right, you've got this 120 over 80. You've got a systolic pressure and a diastolic pressure. It's pulsing back and forth, right? You feel a pulse. You feel a difference in the top and lower number. And you feel those arteries stretching and recoiling as a result. As you get to the regular artery, sink the brachial artery, where you measure blood pressure, it's, it's a little bit lower, but it's still a really good overall indication of the blood pressure, isn't it? It's dropped a little bit, but you still have a nice difference. Could we take blood pressure of your aorta? Wouldn't be a good idea, right? If we could get in there and squeeze it off and take your blood pressure, you're dead. So it's not a good idea. Could we take blood pressure of your carotid arteries? Sure. Not a good idea, though, to squeeze the blood flow from your brain, right? So we do the next best thing. We take blood pressure from the brachial artery in the arm. We can squeeze that, and we can have blood flow restricted to the fingers for a short while without damaging our overall well-being. Now, as we go further away from the arteries and the purple area here are the capillaries. And as you get there, uh, you see that the pressure now has dropped and down to about 40 or so millimeters of mercury. And you also see there's no more pulsing, right? It's going in basically as a little steady stream. It's just kind of, kind of moving in at low pressure. By the time you go through the capillaries, that pressure continues to drop down to about 20 millimeters of mercury. And then as the blood returns through the venules, the veins, and back to the vena cava, we're essentially at zero. So that, again, there's very little pressure on the venous side. I was just wondering, what is it that they strip out of the legs and into the heart when they do? They do veins. Uh, yeah, it's really interesting. And, I, and I've got to do some more research on this. But when they do, um, when they strip uh, when they do a coronary bypass right. and they grab, vein, they grab veins to do it. Now, that seems all backwards to me yeah. because you're thinking, okay, the coronary arteries are arteries and a vein is very wimpy, but also keep in mind those small bypasses are not under tremendous pressure. So, so they're, using veins they're using veins as, as an artery. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's my understanding of it. And, I, and it, it, I always, every time I get to this conversation, I always remind myself, I need to go look that up because how is it or why is it that a wimpy vein is able to replace the structural integrity of an artery? Again, they're just a conduit, but it does seem like we would want to strip an artery, but we can't, right? We can't take part of your femoral artery out. We, so the, the vein, I suppose, is the next best thing. But I've always wondered how and why is it that it's okay? Okay, so great, great thinking there, Nancy. Now, when you take blood pressure, let's take a look at this picture. Um, so a person is going to take the, the cuff. Uh, the sphincter manometer is this instrument that has the dial or the, 
or the, the pressure moment on there, and you're going to pump it up. Now, how high do you need to pump up the pressure on that cuff? Pump, 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 pump. If it's a normal person, they're going to say about 180 to 200. And what it, what's the purpose? You'd want to make sure that you pump up that cuff above the patient's systolic pressure. Now, if they're only 120 over 80, then going up to 180 is plenty. If the person walks into you, though, and you know they have a history of really high hypertension, and they, always, they walk around with a blood pressure of 200 over something, not good, but it happens, you have to pump that thing up even higher. Now, at 180, it hurt, it's starting to get uncomfortable at 180. I can only imagine how uncomfortable it is for a patient with hypertension, and they're having to squeeze that thing up above and beyond 200, because that really does start to get very uncomfortable. I experience that every time I walk in the clinic. I walk in, they assume middle-aged, big guy, high blood pressure. Thankfully, I'm still doing really well. My pressure runs at about 120 over 70. It's still really, really good, but they don't know that. So they look at big guy, and they're up to about 180, and they're, they're still going. I'm like, whoa, honey, we're done. We're, we're, we're fine. I assure you we've gone plenty enough. But I, I, I experience it every single time. They, they just assume that they're going to have to do a few extra pumps. So when they squeeze off the brachial artery, right, and that's what this is showing up here, and when, when we got the pressure high, you are completely closing off the artery. It's squeezed down. There's no blood flow going through the brachial artery. Then as you start to release that pressure on the cuff, at some point, the pressure will reduce and blood will start moving through the brachial artery again because the heart is pushing, right, greater than the restriction of the cuff. Now, about 100 years or so ago, 100 years or, or so ago, a guy named Korokoff, goofing around with the stethoscope-like instrument, noticed that there are some sounds heard through the stethoscope. And so the, he gets the credit for them. They're called the Korofkoff sounds. And the Korofkoff sounds are sounds heard in the stethoscope as blood is moving through the artery, but it's in some way blocked. So as long as there's some restriction of the blood flow through the brachial artery, you will hear Korofkoff sounds. So you'll hear Korofkoff sounds during this blue area because there's restriction in the, in the artery in some way. Then once the cuff has released enough pressure and blow, uh, blood flow has been restored fully and the artery is completely open, you no longer hear Korofkoff sounds. So there's no sounds when it's blocked. There's no sounds when it's wide open. There are only Korofkoff sounds when the vessel is partially open or partially occluded. So what we do then is as the pressure is coming down, the first sound, the first Korofkoff sound you hear, we're going to record it as your systolic pressure. The last Korofkoff sound, as it disappears, you're going to record that as the diastolic pressure. Okay, so you're using those sounds as an indicator of when the pressures were allowing blood to first go through systolic and when blood flow was completely restored diastolic. Did I see a hand question? Now, next semester, we'll do a lot. We'll, we'll measure blood pressure. You'll, you'll become at least a user of this and, and understand it more completely. But at this point, does that make sense? What are you hearing through the stethoscope? You are hearing Korokoff sounds. You are not hearing lub dub. Every semester, I have someone who tries to tell me that with the stethoscope here at the antibrachial region when taking blood pressure, that you're hearing the lub dub, lub dub, lub dub. No. Right? The stethoscope to the heart, then you're hearing lub and dub. When you get the stethoscope to the arm or wherever else you're taking pressure, you're hearing these Korofkoff sounds. And what it really represents is simply the, the blood bouncing off the walls of the partially blocked artery. Nancy. It is sort of a, it is sort of a, you'll, it's sort of a little, yeah, it's just a boom, it's more of a pulse, tw, 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 but you'll hear that sound only during this period when the, when the artery is partially blocked or partially open. 
I have just a few more things, actually very few things, to share with you from this chapter. Then we'll take a break, and we'll come back, and I'm actually going to get started a little bit on the respiratory system and get us going for the next exam. But just a couple more things here. I'm going to hit a couple highlights. I'm going to skip over quite a bit probably, and so what I focus on is what I want you to think about for the exam. If you are going to uh, create the body and put into it some alarm systems, and those alarm systems were to detect high blood pressure, where would you place those alarm systems? Where would you put those sensors to detect high blood pressure? Well, it turns out that the good Lord put some baroreceptors in us. Baroreceptors, we know baro means pressure. So these are receptors that are measuring pressure. And they're located strategically in the aorta. Go back. In the aorta and in the carotids, okay, the aorta and the internal carotids. That's a great place, right, to put up a blood pressure sensor. In the aorta, you just pump blood out of the heart. It's going to all points, and we better take good care of our brain, so I better make sure I have another sensor on the, as, the way, as the blood goes up into the brain through the internal carotids. And here's what happens. When the blood pressure, I'll start at the bottom. When the blood pressure is too high, then these baroreceptors are going to send nerve signals. I have APs here, meaning action potentials. We haven't talked about action potentials this semester. But they're going to send nerve signals at a faster rate. And those, those, that faster rate is going to cause your parasympathetic system to go up and your sympathetic system to go down. So think about that. Your pressure is too high. What do you want to do? Bring it down. How would you bring it down? Well, remember, parasympathetic is rest and digest. So you're going to increase your parasympathetic, and you're going to decrease the fight or flight. Conversely, if your blood pressure is too low, right, and you, you don't have sufficient blood pressure, or you have not enough blood pressure going up your carotid to your brain, that's not good, then there will be signals sent from these baroreceptors that will decrease your rest and digest, and instead increase your fight or flight. Okay, so be baroreceptors in the carotid artery, in the, in the uh, internal carotids that are measuring how your pressure is doing. That's one system of regulation that we have. There's another set of receptors called chemoreceptors. Okay, um, they're located in the same exact place. So these are cells in your aorta, cells in your carotid, that are picking up chemical signals. Now, the signal that they're really picking up is going to be hydrogen ions. Let's go back to our pH discussion. Um, hydrogen ions, remember, more hydrogen, the more acid, right? The more acid, the so if, if, if hydrogen goes up, Upward hydrogen, that means what? Lower pH. Okay, remember this? So the chemoreceptors are really measuring the pH of your blood. It's really what they're measuring. But do you agree that there's a connection between your pH and CO2? We've mentioned this in, in brief passing, but what happens when you add CO2 and water? Or have we discussed this this semester? Maybe we haven't. CO2 and water make carbonic acid. It's an acid. Okay. So if you have more CO2 in your blood, what happens to your pH? It goes down, right? More acidic, lower pH. Well, what do you think your heart's going to do, or what's your body going to do when the amount of CO2 is increasing in your body? Do you agree that increasing CO2 would likely come along with decreased oxygen? Does that relationship make sense? 
as you're exchanging oxygen and CO2, that if you're getting more CO2 in your body, that you would have simultaneously lower oxygen. Does that make sense? And I'm telling you, if you have high CO2, that it's going to do what? Drive your pH down. What would your body's response be to the blood becoming more acidic? Is it going to make the heartbeat faster or make the heartbeat slower? I've got too much CO2. I don't have enough oxygen. <laughs> the body's going to try to get more oxygen by doing what? Beating faster, right? The, the heart's going to try to circulate the, the blood and to get oxygen in. The respiratory system will also increase. So you'll start breathing faster and your heart will start beating stronger and faster as well. So these chemoreceptors are directly measuring pH. But now do you understand that when these chemoreceptors are measuring pH, they're really, that pH is really an indication of how much CO2 there is. And that the amount of CO2 is inversely related to the amount of oxygen. So these, chemo, these chemoreceptors are measuring oxygen and CO2 indirectly, but are measuring acid directly. And we'll talk more about this when we get to the urinary system next week. Um, we'll talk about how the kidneys are getting rid of extra acid in the body and the importance of that. And we'll start to connect much, much stronger. We'll see the connections between the respiratory system, the cardiovascular system, and the urinary system. I'm not seeing a lot of confirmation here. Is this chemoreceptor story making sense? Baroreceptors made sense, right? Yeah. Pressure. Chemoreceptors, measuring the pH of your blood in the same place, right? In the aortic arch and up in the carotids. We're measuring the pH of your blood. If the pH of your blood is is a too acidic. It's too acidic, why? Because you have too much CO2. If you have too much CO2 in your blood, you likely have not enough oxygen. And to increase the oxygenation of your blood, your heart would beat faster, and your lungs would start breathing faster as well. What if the pH was too high? You got it. So if this, so let's let me clean this. If if instead, all I can think is pool chemicals. I can't see the relationship. Right. Okay. So let's think about this. So what I'm telling you is that uh, here you are, the heart, right? And you've got the aortic arch, and then coming off the aortic arch, you got the carotid. So you've got a receptor here and a receptor here up in the, okay, up in the carotids. And those chemoreceptors are measuring pH. If the pH is dropping, it's the low pH. Now, remind me, what's the normal pH of your blood? 7.4. Yep, 7.4 is normal. So if the blood pH starts to drop, right, what does that tell us? If the blood pH is going down, it's because there's too much CO2. Because I just told you that CO2 plus water, the plasma, makes acid, right? So too much CO2 is going to make your blood more acidic. And you agree that high CO2, it would be correlated with low oxygen, right? They're kind of yin-yang. So if there is a low pH, your heart rate's going to go what? Heart rate's going to go up, isn't it? Try to get more oxygen moving through your tissues and try to get more CO2 out. Turn it around. What if there was a higher pH? That's because there is too low a CO2, which would also suggest that you have plenty of oxygen. If you already have plenty of oxygen, your heart's not going to start spazzing out saying, hey, I need more. So it would actually cause your respiratory system and your cardiovascular system to relax. Yes, yes. 
but I want you to also understand the, the, the middle part here. Okay, I want you to, if you can remember this, that CO2 plus water makes acid. Okay, got that. And if CO2 is accumulating in your body, that means what's not happening. If CO2 is accumulating in your blood, it means you're not blowing off enough CO2 in your respiratory system, and it means your heart's not circulating your blood fast enough to make it happen. So if you're accumulating CO2, right, CO2 levels are rising in your blood. As a result, your pH would go down. If your CO2 levels are going up, it would correlate also that you have low oxygen. So again, what would your body do in response to this low pH, high CO2 phenomenon? Your respiration rate would go up, you're going to start breathing faster, and your heart rate's going to go up to also help with that. We're at minute 60. Go back and listen to this, okay? Go back and look at this little chart, and, and if that's not making sense to you. I have just a couple more slides I want to show you. Here's actually where they're located, just to give you a visual. So within the aortic arch, right, you have these receptors and also up in the carotids. Now, the nerve that's, that's connected to this, and this, this should make sense to you, the nerve that's connected to this is the vagus nerve. Hmm. Hmm. Why would that be? What did we say? If the blood pressure is too high here, then you're going to send a signal via the vagus nerve that's going to tell your heart rate to do what? Relax. And you may recall that the vagus nerve is part of your parasympathetic nervous system. So the vagus nerve is helping to cool and calm down your heart when it's being overstimulated. The rest of this, I'm going to skip over most of this because the rest of this is pretty much pictures of arteries and veins. And you already know your arteries and veins. You were quizzed on them this week in lab. You know which ones I talked about. So these slides are repeat. So you've got a beautiful picture here of a guy. He's too small to study on your PowerPoints, I know, but you have a beautiful image of him from your Amerman book. You also have a beautiful image of, of the Venus person. And you can just read through this, and this should help clarify. I'm only going to ask you to know the arteries and veins that we've already labeled in lab. Nothing extra. Okay, so know the same arteries and veins. Coming back to what you were asking, Nancy, before, is what do we do when there's a, a bypass? So if there's a coronary artery bypass, and there's a blockage in an artery, and there's an obstruction of some sort, then they will come in and they will graft an artery, but they're also using veins, as I understand it, for this. So they'll come around and they'll move around that blockage. So if this is the blockage here, they'll actually take a vessel, sew it in, and work around that obstruction. They can also go in with a little balloon type structure and blow up that balloon, and what that will do is open up a narrowing artery. So if someone is getting an atherosclerotic plaque buildup in their arteries, they're getting really restricted. They may go in and do what's called angioplasty or balloon angioplasty, which is what? Balloon, going with a little balloon, angio, vessel, and going in and doing a little bit of, of inflation to break up that plaque and to restore the blood flow back to normal. The rest of this, I think, is just pretty pictures. If we didn't talk about it in lab, you don't need to know it. There's a lot more on these slides than what you need to know. So don't fuss about anything that we didn't discuss directly in lab. So really, all you want to look at is the big guy, the big venous guy, and the big um, arterial person. Let me quiz you on this, though. You can't see this to see the names very well, but let's, let me just quiz you on this. These are all arteries, obviously, looking at the color. So if I were to ask you, what is this? Renal artery, right? Um, this? Common iliac. Internal iliac. External iliac. And once it breaks through the pelvis, then we're going to call this the femoral. Um, that, that's the third branch coming off the aortic arch. Left subclavian. Here's the second branch coming off the aortic arch. 
left common carotid. Here's the first branch right behind the manubrium coming off the aorta. That is the brachiocephalic trunk or the brachiocephalic artery. And that we know is going to split into the right common carotid and the right subclavian. Veins. Let's do the same thing. Coming down from the head. Now, this picture does a better job than any of our models, but I'm not going to get too caught up, sorry, I'm not going to get too caught up on internal versus external jugulars because our models don't do a good job upstairs of it. Our so-and-so model doesn't do it. Our flat Stanley doesn't show it. But here, they, this, this picture does show an internal and external um, jugular coming down. I'm just going to call them the jugulars. What do the jugulars do? They merge with the subclavian. Remember, blood's coming back to the heart. And once the subclavian comes over and the jugular comes down, that merges to become the brachiocephalic. That happens on both sides, and both brachiocephalics then merge to become the superior vena cava. Good. Um, this would be the renal vein. Common iliac, same story. Internal iliac, external iliac, and then the femoral. Those are the big ones, guys. Okay, if those are making sense to you, then you're in good shape for my test as well as for the practical. And we're only two weeks from the practical, so knowing your arteries and veins are important. I'm going to go to one more point that um, gave some students some trouble or seems to give students trouble. I'm going to go to this hepatic portal system. Let me introduce this to you. I, don't, I did not mention this in lab, but it was on your list to know. And no one asked me, I recall, for clarification on this, or at least not very many people. I'm going to go to the picture of this to show you this. So we know that your small intestine, right? All this is, here's your stomach coming down and dumping into your what? Duodenum. And right there is the pancreas. And then you've got all this small intestine, right? And what's going on through the length of the small intestine? Absorbing nutrients. Fenestrated capillaries absorbing nutrients. And those nutrients are all being absorbed into your bloodstream. Remember, right below the mucosal layer, there's that submucosal layer within the gut. And that's where all those blood vessels are. And they're going to pick up these nutrients. And those nutrients are going to make their way. Look at all these vessels. <clears throat> They're all going to make their way up into the liver. And all of those vessels are going to merge into what's called the hepatic portal vein. So all of the nutrients are coming, quote, into port. They're all coming up into the liver. And then what's the liver going to do? Detoxifies, right? It's going to check out all those nutrients, make sure there's nothing in there that's going to harm us. And then once those nutrients have been, quote, checked, then they're going to leave out of the liver through a left and right hepatic vein. The hepatic veins will then merge back into the inferior vena cava, and now those nutrients are part of our general circulation. They're going to go off to the heart, go off to the lung, get reoxygenated, and then that blood with all those new nutrients will now be shipped around the body um, for nutrition. Okay, so that's the hepatic portal and the hepatic vein, the distinction between those two. Other than that, these are just pretty pictures. Again, don't bog yourself down with anything that wasn't on our list. And I just want to get to the last couple slides about, oh, this is a good one to remember, though. Um, this is your fetal circulation. I, I mentioned it in lab. But coming in, this is the placenta, placenta, and, the, and that's where the oxygen's coming in, and it's traveling through the umbilical what? It's going toward the baby's heart. So it's in the umbilical vein, but that is red blood. And it's coming in to the umbilicus, and it's draining into the baby's inferior vena cava. So that means that the blood coming into the baby's heart is already oxygenated. So it doesn't go, it goes into the right atrium, but rather than going down to the right ventricle and then over to the lungs, 
It instead will be shunted directly through that opening in the heart called the foramen ovale, over to the left side, sent around the baby's body, and then that used up blood, if you will, will be returned through the umbilical, it's going away from the baby's heart, so it's the umbilical artery. And the umbilical artery would come back to the placenta carrying blue blood. So again, that's the other blue and red flip in your lifetime. So finally, I want to get to this last slide about aging, what happens. Well, as we age, the heart and the vessels become less resilient. They don't stretch as well. They, they are less elastic. They don't pulse as much. And so what will happen is that the blood pressure will start to increase. And, and the reason the blood pressure will increase is that the heart is, is actually um, becoming less efficient. And because of this increased blood pressure, individuals are at greater risk for an aneurysm. Again, an aneurysm is when an arterial wall begins to thin out and bulges out, and it's like an old, cheap <coughs> garden hose, and it kind of gets a bulge, and then it blows. And um, that's a really dangerous situation because the arteries are under such pressure that that could be a very major bleed, okay, internally, if there's an aneurysm. If it's going up to the brain, it can certainly be the cause of a stroke. And again, those walls, because they're less elastic, become more brittle, and they become more prone to, think of it like cracking. They can crack or become crunchy, and that can lead to rupturing and massive bleeding and death. A large part of this changing of the arterial walls has to do with atherosclerosis, and if we break that word down, uh, athro means what? Athro, fat, sclero, Hardening, hard, osis, a condition of, right? So a condition of hardened arteries from a buildup of fat and lipid-like materials that clog up the inside of the arteries. So that brings us to the end of the material for exam number five next week. I'll give you about a five or six minute break and we'll come back and we'll start talking a little bit about the respiratory system. The final exam, again, is not a cumulative exam. It's going to cover respiratory, urinary and reproductive. So that's what's left uh, for us to discuss after the exam will be respiratory, urinary, and reproductive.